In this week's discussion, an important criticism was made of the second premise of the argument we are considering. This premise makes the claim that lying disrespects the person who is lied to. The criticism suggested is that this premise is false because there are cases where lying is necessary to protect another person. What really matters is the intention behind the lie. Is someone lying merely to deceive and swindle another person? That seems clearly disrespectful. But what about to protect someone from harm? Is lying for that reason really disrespectful? I want to think about this question further because it touches on many important concepts in moral philosophy that will arise in this class. And I want to consider the possibility that even protective lies might be disrespectful. Although later we can think more about whether this should change how we think about the nature of respect. Consider the example of lying to a child to protect that child in some way. A parent might lie to the child about something rather mundane. For instance, if you don't go potty now and instead wait until the last minute after we have already left the house, then you might miss out on doing X, Y, and Z fun things while you are away in the bathroom. Or, on the other hand, a parent might lie to a young child about more serious things that the child simply lacks the emotional capacity to process. Or at least the parent may decide not to disclose certain facts about that situation. Each of these in their own way is an instance of a parent protecting a child from something that would be bad for them. And depending upon the details of the particular circumstance, we generally don't see anything disrespectful about doing this. What does this example tell us about the nature of respect? Why is it exactly that we do not necessarily find it disrespectful to lie to children? It is because children have diminished capacity to handle stress, understand complex situations, and consider the long-term consequences of their actions. You cannot simply lay out a set of options in front of a child and expect them to reliably choose what might even obviously be in their best interest. Children simply do not have adult decision-making abilities. This indicates that whether lying is disrespectful may depend upon to whom the lie is told and what that individual is like. Lying to a child can be acceptable because children are vulnerable, not fully rational, and in need of guidance and protection. But isn't this precisely why lying to an adult would be disrespectful? Doesn't this show that, even if protection is the motive, lying to an adult treats that person like a child? Even protective actions can border upon disrespect. Whether justified or not, this is what lies behind the attitude of those who are annoyed with government paternalism. Consider, for example, a law that requires seatbelt use. The law is intended to protect people from their own bad decisions, but the opposition, those who oppose this law, usually retort that they are adults, not children, and they can make their own decisions. So, it may be possible for intentionally protective acts to still be disrespectful. If so, then perhaps we need to think further about the conception of disrespect itself. Thus far, we have assumed that there are two distinct categories of people, children and adults. And furthermore, that there is a specific point in time when a person leaves behind the immaturity and vulnerability of childhood and develops into a fully rational and capable adult. The law seems to assume this by identifying the age of 18 as a stark dividing line. It may be the case that for legal purposes, this strict demarcation is needed. But we all know that this severely oversimplifies how things are in the real world. We do not magically become capable of complete rational self-control at the age of 18, never having to again worry about temptation or frailty. The idealized state of adulthood is something we embody to varying degrees throughout our lives. At various points, we might find ourselves suffering from mental and physical illness, emotional trauma, or material hardship. 
there are in fact a whole range of circumstances that can prevent us from making informed, rational decisions about what is in our best interest. Think about someone facing a serious, life-threatening illness. Should a physician working with such a patient be completely honest about the odds of recovery or survival? Would a patient in such a compromised state be able to hear that information without despairing or losing hope? What effect would that have on the efficacy of future treatment? These are all pertinent questions that need to be asked seriously. Perhaps it is always disrespectful to lie to a fully rational adult human being with the emotional maturity to look with clear eyes at the options before them and make an informed judgment about what is best. But how often do any of us completely resemble that ideal? And how many situations are there which prevent us from achieving this standard? So, perhaps the duty of respect isn't as universal as we tend to think. Not, at least, if the duty of respect requires us to act as though the typical human possesses a level of rationality and self-control that, in reality, is probably quite rare. Or, perhaps what we need to do is rethink what it means to respect another person in the first place. Certainly, it would be disrespectful to completely ignore the fact that other people have reason and the ability to think for themselves. Yet, wouldn't it also be rather disrespectful to ignore the reality of their human vulnerability? Ultimately, perhaps what is required could be a conception of respect which recognizes all the various facets, abilities, and susceptibilities of the human condition.